right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Passive House 101 series by the Passive House Accelerator, the show where we try to make it accessible for everyone to get into Passive House. My name is Jose and I will be your host for the next hour. Today's presentation is 10 Steps to Building a Multifamily Passive House, presented by Michelle Apigian. Uh, a brief intro about Michelle. Uh, Michelle is an architect, planner, and urban designer who combines optimism and pragmatism to design sustainable environments that strengthen community and celebrate the uniqueness of a place. She believes that design should anchor, fortify, and inspire. She's a passionate advocate for the environment and the integration of sustainability and resiliency into architecture and construction. She has worked on a broad array of project types and scales, from large multi-phase master plans uh, and design and construction of new, uh, new multifamily developments to strategic infill, adaptive reuse, and modernization projects. Her work includes the first Passive House Certified Multifamily Project in Massachusetts, as well as numerous LEED certified projects, and she is a frequent speaker on topics including building reuse and passive house design. Michelle also has a BA from Dartmouth University and a Master's in Architecture and Master's of City Planning from MIT. With that said, I encourage you all to ask questions, share your comments in the chat, and we will have a live QA at the end of the presentation. So now, to share with us your knowledge on building a passive house, I'll cede the space to Michelle. Awesome. Um, so I'm Michelle Pigian. Uh, I work with Icon Architecture. We are a Boston-based uh, firm um, experiencing the smoke that we were chatting about earlier in the West Coast. Um, we are proud to be women-owned um, and have been for, I want to say, 15 years or so. Um, we're about a firm of 50, and we do a lot of work together, but we also have a lot of fun together. Um, we do a lot of multifamily housing, which is clearly going to be my focus today, um, both new construction, high rise, low rise, as well as a lot of uh, existing building renovations and adaptive reuse, which is always fun. Uh, but we also have an institutional practice that focuses on municipal buildings, educational facilities, um, and again, often, often, more and more often interfacing with existing buildings and how to kind of bring them up to speed. Um, we have been on a journey with Passive House, and I will say that uh, it's not entirely of our making, and I'm going to explain a little bit about how we got here. Uh, Massachusetts has got some phenomenal programs that have been in place and been developing to help uh, inspire Passive House design. Um, but you can see we've had tremendous growth uh, starting with our first Passive House building, which um, was completed in 2017, the distillery. Um, and now Passive House projects represent over 30% of our overall office um, billings, which is pretty astounding in a short period of time. Uh, so these are the first three that we built and got certified. The distillery on the left uh, is a market rate multifamily. Um, 29 units. Finch Cambridge, our first affordable multifamily at 98 units. Um, and Harbor Village is 30 units of affordable multifamily as well. We have a number of projects under construction at this point. Um, all, all of these that you're seeing plus the list to the right. Um, so we're, we're not only focused at the moment on designing these new construction buildings, but really how do they get, how do we help um, make sure that they're executed the way we intended? Um, we also have many, many more on the boards. And again, this is not entirely uh, due to uh, our remarkable superhero abilities. It's really due to a culture in Massachusetts that's, um, that we've benefited from tremendously. So here are my 10 steps. I'm going to dive into them so you don't need to memorize this list. Um, the first one, which I, I listened to some of the other presentations, which were great, um, and everyone seems to concur that it really takes a team. Um, and I just, I think you can't, it can't go unsaid in any of these. Uh, it takes a team, and in these case of these larger buildings, even a bigger team, um, the teams just seem to get, be multiplying. Um, 
And it takes, I would say, of course it takes cooperation and a commitment and that goes without saying, but you also have to have a pretty strong backbone um, and a definite sense of adventure because we're often kind of charting unknowns, um, as well as I would say a lot of humility. Um, none of us knows it all. And the curiosity that is necessary to sort of, you know, figure out how to do something right and how to do something well at scale, as well as cost effectively, sometimes takes some humble pie, uh, listening to a builder explain, for example, how your detail makes no sense whatsoever and could never be achieved, um, architect. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of appreciate the fact that we are not builders and that we learn every day from them. Uh, and they're a critical part of the team as are everybody else on the design team, as well as our third party consultants and verifiers and modelers, um, et cetera. The first two, the next two pieces I'm going to talk about are really about the landscape that has evolved in Massachusetts. So um, we have developed some serious carrots um, and some serious sticks. Um, the carrots came early, um, obviously with an intention to um, incentivize Passive House and make it more palatable for teams to consider doing it, particularly as they kind of acknowledge that there's a likely a premium in cost. So the first critical thing, and I saw I saw my CEC on this call earlier. Um, the first critical thing that happened was the um, Mass uh, Clean Energy Center issued the Passive House Design Challenge in 2018, which ultimately funded eight affordable housing um, projects at four thousand dollars a unit um, if they were if they were willing to pursue Passive House, and that came with some important caveats. I think the most critical of which was the team needed to track and identify what the true cost premium was and sort of what those what was driving that um, so that we collectively the agencies in the state could better understand um, what's going on price wise and stop stop hanging hemming and hawing about how this is just crazy expensive and it's going to crush the entire industry um, and really understand where where the opportunities were. Um, so we were lucky enough to have been awarded two of those projects, um, Finch and Harbor Village. Um, I think all of the rest, if I'm not mistaken, Beverly can chime in in the chat, um, are, if, are under construction at a minimum, if not complete. Uh, and the outcome of that was a general sense that the cost premium uh, for those eight teams, um, again, this is affordable housing, so money is tight. Uh, was one and a half to five percent give or take, but sort of averaging in the twos, two percent range, which is pretty remarkable. That helped um, make the case for Mass Save, which is a program that the utilities, um, uh, I don't know if I offer is really necessarily the right term, but it's the utilities way of helping push the um, building industry to be more energy efficient. Uh, and they offer $3,000 a unit uh, to any multifamily developer. Um, so the market is suddenly uh, part of the equation. And then finally, all of that also supported uh, our Department of Housing and Community Development, which just got renamed um, to something about housing and livable communities. Um, but they, their QAP, their Qualified Allocation Plan, which um, awards points to affordable housing teams pursuing funding, which is critical, um, added points for Passive House. So very quickly, this is what the Mass Save program in sense. It's not just the, if you look between the pre-certification and certification, it's $3,000 a unit. Um, but up above, they also incented, importantly, early feasibility studies with energy modeling, as well as um, some of the cost of full energy modeling. And here in the QAP, they offered eight points. Um, so you can see at the top, if I can move my camera can't. I think it was three points for lead in the enterprise green, four points if you're willing to do a HERS approach, and eight points for passive house. So that definitely moved the needle. And I can't think of a single affordable housing project since this occurred, um, certainly none in our office that is doing anything other than passive house. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we also have been developing a few sticks um, and this has taken longer because codes take longer, um, but it isn't just codes. It's also um, some communities have really focused on how to incorporate it into their zoning. Um, they've focused on reporting. And so if you have to report at a certain scale, your energy usage, and then the market gets to see that, then maybe you'll be more sensitive to um, the energy use of your building. Um, so importantly, in 2015, our, um, our, um, there was a mass amendment to the IBC 2015, which allowed Passive House as an alternative to compliance pass. It was the first time that Passive House was kind of given credibility and merit um, in the building code. Then uh, there have been since then a lot of amazing community advocacy, which has pushed zoning, pushed policy, um, and even sort of what's per what can be permitted and how. Um, and then most recently, just last year, after a long journey, um, we have what's called the stretch code, which is um, which communities, and there are 300 and some of them in Massachusetts, um, can vote to um, to approve, and that effectively pushes your energy usage above and beyond what um, the the code would allow. Um, and so we've revamped that in the last year, um, really ratcheting down uh, allowable energy use, emphasizing. Um, fossil fuel free, and there's now a new opt-in zero energy stretch code, which already I think 12 communities in, in the state have adopted. Um, some of this has already come into play starting in January of this year. The rest will come into play in July of this year. So right at the end of the month, you can imagine how our developer friends are, are eager to get permitted right now <laughs> for the month ends. Um, so the zoning, for example, this is Somerville zoning, and it specifically says if you are multifamily and you are wanting a density bonus, you can have a few more units, um, then you must be FIAS certified or ILFI. I haven't seen a project use the latter yet, but I'm open to considering that. Um, we also, uh, as I said, the stretch code is now specifically calls out passive house as one of the compliance paths. There are others. Um, but I frankly think it's the most straightforward way to go about achieving the performance that is mandated um, by the new stretch code. Okay, now we're gonna get into the design side of things. Um, but I think the first parts are important because without that, it's much more challenging to convince large developers who are used to doing things a certain way um, to try something different. Uh, so step one, what is inside your passive house boundary and what is outside the passive house boundary? And um, this is gets a lot more complicated when you have a multifamily building, particularly when you have a mixed use multifamily building. And many of ours are, they're in urban locations, there's commercial on the ground floor, um, Harbor Village has, or our, our new project in Salem has a food pantry, Harbor Village has um, you know, some local arts, so, and you never know exactly what that use is gonna be. So we have long made the case that those spaces, for example, might wanna be outside the passive house boundary. Um, there are also, um, tr the trash room is a source of um, many questions. Um, and we tend to keep it, we like to keep the chute anyway outside the boundary, even though it can be taped off during the blower door tests, because we think it's good practice from an airtight perspective. Um, laundry is another, Big question: If you need, if you have a laundry room and you have a lot of makeup air that's required, that can really change the ventilation uh, in parameters, and we don't want that to affect the rest of the building. So, figuring out what's in or out is critical. And I wrote, "Get ready to defend it," because FIAS has increasingly um, been reticent to allow certain spaces to be outside the envelope. So, you really need to be able to explain your rationale and the logic of it. Um, and why you think you know it? It's fundamentally a different space and would impact um, the building differently. And so that needs to happen in plan. It also needs to happen in section. And then, as I'll get into, of course, every place that these inside and outside spaces are coming together has to be detailed so that we understand how to create continuity. 
Next step is um, understanding your systems. And this can get really tricky with multifamily. There are a lot of variables and I know um, uh, Tim McDonald has has definitely offered a number of course, courses, as I'll say, on sort of the decision matrix that uh, a team should go through. But fundamentally, are you wanting individual systems or are you wanting central systems? Does every unit get their own ERV and their own uh, heating and cooling uh, condenser? Um, how, is hot water a central system or is that a shared system? Um, and these have huge impacts, not only on who pays the bills. So with our affordable housing clients, most typically heating and ventilation are inherently going to be um, paid for by the owner. I would even go say most typically hot water is typically paid for by the owner. Cooling is a bit of a wild card up until a few years ago, as we've started to kind of understand that our temperatures are changing in, in our climate zone. Um, cooling historically wasn't funded by that how the Department of Housing and Community Development in Massachusetts. It was not considered necessary. That has evolved a little bit. Uh, so in our early projects, Harbor Village being one of them, we actually have a very conventional thin tube heating system, but then we wanted to have cooling and we wanted the tenants to pay for it because we didn't think DHCD would support the owner paying for it. Um, also, if it's central, uh, there's just a completely different routing strategy, ductwork running up and down corridors that can be really challenging to um, coordinate and think about how it's coming in and out of uh, units, um, penetrating rated assemblies. Um, and then of course there's uh, the dryers and, and the range, you know, are typically we're seeing, we don't see gas ranges in our passive house projects. Um, at, and generally if the dryers are gas, it's because, well, if the dryers are gas, it's because there's a central laundry room. And again, that's another reason that we, there you're gonna need all that makeup there and you're gonna need to think about how you compartmentalize that space. Another big implication of having individual versus central systems is how much um, equipment is going to land somewhere on the site. Generally, in our urban conditions, it's on the roof. On the left is Finch, where everything is central. Um, heating, cooling, ventilation, and hot water. So we have simultaneous VRF system. We have shared condensers associated with that. And you can see that it allows a lot of space on that roof for PV, which is a great thing. Um, we have a 105 kW array there, which covers about 20% of the overall um, energy load of the building, which again is all paid for by the owner with the exception of um, plug loads inside the units. On the top right, much ha oh, sorry, a much hazier roof image, but that's Harbor Village where we have this individual cooling approach. And so much smaller building, 30 units, so a third the size, um, but that equipment takes up a whole much, a whole lot more space on the roof and limits how much PV. And we do actually now have PV. This picture hasn't picked, hasn't caught up with the times, but we finally do have PV on the roof. And on the bottom right is what it looks like when you have all these individual condensers, right? It's just, it's, it's busy, it's messy. Um, not to mention finding the paths for all of those condensers to the unit can be challenging. Okay. Tip number six, model, don't just guess. Um, and so this is something we've really taken to heart um, because we are typically working in SketchUp for um, early visualization because Revit, those who are um, familiar with the program, it's an understatement to say that Revit is an easy tool to be facile with design in. It's, it's very onerous, it's very precise. And we, decided it would be beneficial for us to be doing these early feasibility studies. Often we're doing this early sketchup work at a point where we're going through permitting. We don't necessarily even have a structural engineer or a mechanical engineer yet doing the work. Um, but we, we've done this enough and we've got some great collaborators in other CPHCs with whom we worked on a number of projects. Um, that we've gotten a sense of how to sort of input some initial systems ideas. Most importantly, 
we can really understand when we model early how orientation and insulation levels assemblies uh, impact the design. And um, let's see. So often, um, one of the cool things about the feasibility study that as is funded up to $5,000 through Mass Save, and remarkably, that's just what we charge, $5,000 for a feasibility study. So if there's, it's a no cost to the owner, and we can test, okay, you, you're wondering if we could use double paned windows. You're wondering if we could get away with that exterior insulation. You're wondering if we need so much on the roof. Um, we can quickly test all that um, and show them with, our, with the Woofy outputs um, what works and what doesn't. And invariably, at least in our climate, um, you can't get away with anything but triple glazed windows. You cannot get away with um, no continuous insulation. Um, and otherwise, what's interesting about, um, we, all, we often present this to our clients when we're walking them through the feasibility study, certain things are not that wildly different, right? Like slab insulation, we generally don't have to do anything more than we would typically do. Yes, we do more at the roof, but you have to do tapered insulation for a lot of our building typologies anyway, and it's not that huge of an ad. Obviously, we're going to add that two inches of insulation at the wall, so typically it's two. Um, and we've got to have better windows. And very importantly, the market loves big, huge windows. And I walk all around our city, um, and I see curtains closed, like on all these high-rise, all-glass buildings. Like they, they love those big windows, but it turns out that people living in those units don't really love those big windows. They're not very furnishable. They're not very private. Um, and they definitely are not energy appropriate. So I, we see the glazing ratios closer to the 20% range is just fine. You get it, you get plenty of light where you need it. Um, and windows don't have to go all the way to the floor in every bedroom, for example. Um, the most critical piece, um, and I liked your intro. Oh, sorry, uh, Zach. But the most critical piece from our perspective is really the infiltration. Um, and that is where sort of the unsung hero. And so we often show them, you know, what happens if you don't change, if you did all the rest of this on, on the right, but you didn't change infiltration, you, you can't get there. Um, so that's why that lower door test at the end is so critical. Um, we don't just test with modeling. We also engage, sometimes we do this in-house, sometimes we use consultants. Um, we test tricky conditions that we're a little nervous about. Um, to make sure that we don't have moisture issues. Um, so some therm or hydrothermal analysis, um, not a bunch of it, but in, again, in sort of unique conditions. And frankly, we, we were doing this several years back, but now EAS is routinely asking us to, as a team to do this on a, anything that they um, don't think we've thought through. So it's good practice to just sort of understand um, on the bottom middle there, you're seeing above those two Vs, you're seeing two beautiful structural thermal breaks. Um, that was what we needed to make sure that that steel beam didn't make the slab above it freezing cold. Um, so it's it's sort of understanding the conditions and making sure we 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 know where the dew point is and we're, we're not at risk of condensation inside the building. That's really what we're looking for. Uh, and then we can, again, show our, not just our team, but our clients, here's what happens when you're just following the code, and here's what happens when we do what we're kind of describing. Um, and I will know that when we show this code baseline approach, we actually don't change the systems from our high performance heat pump technology. Um, we don't change the systems at all. So. It's not truly apples to apples. It would certainly get even worse because you're going to need more bigger equipment and it's probably not going to be heat pump technology if you want your residents to be happy and comfortable. Um, so we, we really like to show them just where the, where the flash points are, if you will. And, and we also very much like to have a, a buffer of about 10% at this feasibility stage. That's kind of where we've found that we um, beyond that, we, you know, when it gets tighter than that, we get anxious um, because a lot happens as you go deeper into the design and you start to really dial in the efficiencies of the equipment and 
the exact you know psi values of the windows and all that and you typically something starts to creep up a little bit so having a little bit of buffer not just being right on the on the needle uh, is important and i will also point out um, in these multifamily buildings a huge difference from single family or much smaller scale is that they tend to be um, very cooling load dominated in the model because there are a lot of occupants, very dense, a lot of equipment, um, throwing off heat inherently, um, no matter what. These aren't you know, two-story single family homes with four people and one fridge, one stove, et cetera. Um, so it, uh, generally speaking, we don't have a hard time hitting the heat, um, the heat metrics when we've got our continuous insulation. It's the cooling load that um, is often a tougher nut to crack. And we can, in some cases, as with Finch, we really couldn't get there, that that one front facade that uh, you've seen many a time um, has solar shading on it because that's almost directly south facing. And there was no way to, to dial things in just with the window alone. Um, so we added shading, but in many cases, depending on orientation, we can just work with the solar heat gain coefficient on different facades and, and get that cooling load down where we need it. It's a balancing act because if you increase that coefficient, you also increase the heating, but we usually have more wiggle room there. All right, keeping it simple. Um, we have learned the hard way <laughs> that, <laughs> Um, every single transition is really complicated, and it's usually the more vulnerable uh, places in the building, particularly from a blower door perspective, but it's also true from a thermal continuity perspective. Um, so most of us don't want to design just a simple box um, or a simple rectangle, but um, and I remember Tessa's presentation, she talked about like that one move, maybe you just need one move. Maybe that can be more complicated and we can sort through that, but um, multiple moves all over the projects is not only expensive, but it's hard to do well. Um, and it's inevitably where we find our, our vulnerabilities is where these transitions occur. So here's Finch. Um, in the plan, the dark gray shaded area is the entrance lobby with offices and a meeting room and a sprinkler room and our vestibules. Um, and we really wanted that to be outside the passive house boundary because um, the use was so different. Our owner felt like um, they, they had expected that they'd be having sort of farmers markets and other events in there. They might be bringing in more of the community. So sometimes it would have nobody in it and sometimes it might have 40 people in it. Uh, and they really, um, we thought that this space needed to be treated differently. But every single trend, every single touch point between that gray box um, and the white around it is a detail that needs to be sought, figured out. And it's not just in plan, it's also in section because there's a, a unit, there are units above that gray zone. So how are we making sure that we've got airtight separation? In this case, um, you know, this space is heated. So this is an, that's an adiabatic relationship. So we're less worried about insulation but we definitely need to, we want the air tightness to be separate. And this space has its own ERV, its own heating and cooling uh, unique to it so that its set points can kind of meet what's going on in the space. Similarly, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, trash room and the laundry room are areas that we often um, keep outside the passive house envelope. In this case, the laundry room has, I want to say, 10 washers and 10 dryers. Um, that's a lot of equipment. Often many of them are running at once. There's a huge amount of makeup air that's required just by the co mechanical code uh, to make that happen. And you can imagine um, if you've got this whoosh of air coming in from the outside, how that would impact the overall um, ventilation profile of the rest of the building. So we, again, these are, um, primarily adiabatic spaces, but we it's it's how do you separate them air tightness wise and it's very tricky and in the case of the trash room it's above a unit right I, I, not the trash room the uh, laundry room it's above a unit so how are we making that separation in section is often more challenging um, than in plan let's see and 
this is what it looks like in the real world when you try to put all these different pieces together uh, and it's not just zip sheathing on a flat surface um, with taped joints. It gets very complicated. Sequence matters, how the product's interface matters. You probably have multiple trades coming together. Um, so it's a lot to think through. It's totally doable. Um, but if you're preferring fewer headaches, try to have fewer transitions is really the bottom line. All right, communication. You've obviously seen um, some of the things we do graphically to try to be articulate about where our boundaries are, um, what's inside and outside, how the transitions work, but the graphics is critical. We nowadays, since GCs use tablets for the most part, and there's they're often not even referring to a physical set of drawings. We just do, we do a lot of that work in color. Our air barrier has a color, our insulation has a color, the transition taped joints um, have our, you know, have a special tone. And that's all we don't have to usually print it in color um, because they're they're seeing it digitally anyway. Um, there are some hidden gems about specifications that can really help us. Um, and I know um, others have talked about kind of stealth pack, passive house, Jesse. Um, and the spec is a place where a lot of that can happen. You can articulate your window U values there and not really say much about it in the plans. I mean, you need to detail how it goes in, but same with your air, air tightness um, and your insulation. So the spec is an important place to augment the drawings. And then how we communicate during construction, because it doesn't really, it doesn't end at design, right? It, it, you're trying to execute the project and get it to go at the end um, and get it to pass. So again, we do a lot with color, um, talking not only about full building air tightness and th our thermal boundary, but also internal compartmentalization and making sure those demising walls are all clearly um, understood to be uh, also uh, needing to be airtight and separate so that smells are not passing back and forth between units, sounds are not passing back and forth. I will say that you will see on this drawing, um, a lot of specificity in terms of product. That is not usually what we do. This actually came about during construction when we realized that the contractor was not totally following. And so since they already had um, taken, you know, they'd already bought out certain trades, we went very deep into exactly which product exactly where, but I don't recommend that approach as a general rule. Um, if you can get it um, clear from the get-go, um, it's better. We have also learned to speak the language of the contractor if we want them to understand what we're trying to get to. So most of our projects, um, most builders at this scale work with the three week look ahead. It's a way to understand what trades are gonna be on site over the coming few weeks and what work is expected to be done. It's a way that we can all kind of understand how progress is going and whether we're on schedule or not. But just as important, it's a way for us to understand what details or what work is upcoming that might relate to those areas we have flagged as being important transitions in our passive house envelope. And when we can see looking out three weeks, oh, you guys are gonna be doing the trash chute. Let's talk about how we'd like to compartmentalize the trash chute which trades are going to be involved. It's going to be the carpenters. It's going to be, um, you know, the mechanical person who's doing the, the duct work. Let's talk through it and let's get everyone on a pre-con call for just a half an hour and make sure we all understand the detail. And this is where the humility often comes into play because more often than not, the detail that, you know, we thought it was going to go in a certain order. We get on the call with the four or five different trades and they start talking and they start saying, oh no, don't, no, no, I have to go in first. We can't, we can't do it after that, that trade. And so then we need to rethink our detail uh, to some extent, but we can do that together proactively before it actually gets installed, as opposed to having to remediate uh, new construction work, which drives me bananas. Unfortunately, definitely happens, but um, to the extent we can avoid that, it's really helpful. And so when we look at the three week look ahead, we can start to mark up a drawing and say, hey, that, 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 those stairs are gonna be, oh, those stairs are gonna be important. Let's get on a call, let's talk about those stairs. 
look at all the trades that um, have to come into play. It's a stairwell, oh my. We don't always do these 3D axonometric drawings um, and we definitely didn't do it in the set. This came during construction again because we realized there was some confusion and it partly was on our end, you know? So we did this so that we could really see how it was coming together, really identify what we thought was happening in what order by who. And then we got in a call and lo and behold, um, you know, we weren't entirely right. And we rethought it a little bit, but they were able to get there. I will say when we did the blower door testing, this kind of detail right here was one of our weakest points, right? It looks pretty complicated. It is pretty complicated. Um, and that's, again, where the devil is in the details. The other thing I would say, and I, and I, I was on the accelerated reform a couple of years back, and um, I definitely used a few of these slides, but it's still critically important. When we first um, were trying to get our builders up to speed on Passive House, and at this moment, every project, I've, every Passive House project we've built has been a different builder who'd never done it before. Um, and so it's, there's a learning curve, but at first we were like, this is a Passive House, everybody, no holes in the building, don't do anything. And it was really, um, it was our own anxiety that led us to go down that path. Um, we were finding that builders were pricing things with crazy numbers because we were putting the fear of God into them and they didn't know what they were giving into. And it was not good. It was not wise. Um, so what we have since learned is that really every trade just needs to do their work to the best of their ability. And the truth is that every trade is critical and every trade is a craft. And so, and people want to do good work. And if we encourage them about how much we value their work, as opposed to Assuming that if you slap up and staple some Tyvek, you know, that's going to be just fabulous. Um, they tend to take a lot of care and they tend to be very proud. So the air bearer, as I've said, is critical. And I personally um, got Kayo, uh, the foreman's phone number. And, you know, if he had a question or a concern, he could call me anytime if the builder wasn't right on available. The plumber is critically important. We have holes that come up through slabs and go through roofs and sometimes through sidewalls. Um, and Ian took a lot of care, but he didn't get it right the first time on the left. Um, and then on the right, we went back and we did it again. And then he got them all right. And it was awesome because there were a lot of penetrations in this slab over an unheated garage. So if it hadn't been right, it would have been very problematic. Um, the HVAC team was awesome and they took it on themselves to test sections of their ERV ductwork on their own um, because they were, they were so concerned about the ductwork being airtight. Uh, and I will say that ERV ductwork that is running through big multifamily buildings like this is very tricky. It's very hard to keep it airtight and it needs to be airtight for it to be balanced properly. So um, kudos to Sean and his team. And then the electrician, whose name I do not know, but he had big fingers, apparently, because um, sometimes he would um, make a hole that you could sit, fit, fit your whole hand through. Um, and we sort of had to remind him, no, no, there's another way to do it. Let's, let's do it a little tighter. Um, and he got the memo. And then there's the person who was working on the exterior electrical outlets. And then someone else came in and was doing the ones in the advising walls and didn't get the memo. So we had to refresh the memo. All right, two more. Ninth is testing, testing, testing. I think I heard this um, on a, in a number of the prior presentations, but it is so critical. Every The best of intentions don't necessarily pan out perfectly, um, and we won't know unless we um, inspect visually with our radar verifier team. Sometimes we use infrared when we have the right temperature delta to understand where, if there's insulation gaps. Um, the blower door test is, of course, critical. And for us, we find, because these buildings are very large, um, being prepared with some fog, um, again, could be some infrared. Uh, our last team used a drone, actually, that shot around the building to just kind of watch where the smoke might be going. Um, but being able to see for real where we're having issues so that th those areas can be addressed before we fully button everything up. And then, of course, commissioning the equipment 
so often the best of equipment still doesn't work perfectly the first time. It just, it needs to be calibrated, right? Um, sometimes it needs to be calibrated a few times. Um, so, you know, looking at what's going on, having a third set of eyes to inspect uh, is very, very important. Um, here were, was our blower door test sequence at uh, Harbor Village. So you can see that we had five. That's the most I've done so far. Um, it was a struggle. And frankly, on the last one, we were holding our breath, not sure if we were gonna be able to get there. Uh, but we had, we had the fog, we had a great support um, with New Ecology, um, our, our CPHC and, ver and verifier uh, on that, that project. Actually, no, our verifier on that project. Um, really helping us chase the chase the issues, identify and slowly whittle down until we were in a very narrow band of one area at the entrance lobby that just was was our issue. Um, here are some of the things that we could find when we were tracking. Right, we could see that the pipe running through that CME wall wasn't caulked or sealed. Uh, same with all those electrical um, conduit on the top right and the fire protection on the top right. The roof hatch um, on our roof access was literally bent and not closing properly. So that was a fundamental problem. Um, again, you know, making sure those pipes coming up through the slab, again, over unconditioned space in this case, are well insulated and sealed. And in the end, that last floor door test, um, the building was so tight and so quiet that there was a whistling, like a light whistling that was totally audible from the lobby where the blower door was. And following it up through the building, we came to this window on the left, which turned out didn't have a gasket on the bottom sill, but we wouldn't have ever known that if it weren't for the blower door. So um, testing, it's, you just can't say enough about it. All right, last but not least, I think. Okay. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, yes, we want to get certified. Yes, we want to hit that air tightness. Are we always going to? Probably not. I, we definitely have some built so far. We've been lucky. Um, we definitely have some buildings that are doing all the right things and designing to the passive house standard, but aren't actually going to certify. Uh, we're still going to do some testing, but they may not quite hit the mark. Is that, is that a disaster? No, if you've done all of this, you know, with this level of thought and care, obviously you're gonna have a great low energy building, but I mean, it's gonna be so quiet and comfortable. It's gonna be healthy. All the things that Zach was saying in his intro, highly resilient and really important here because thermal stability is important um, with cold winters. And of course, affordable to operate for life for whoever is paying those bills. And this is just sort of to make that point. Um, this is a slide of New York City's inventory. Uh, it's from a few years ago now, 2013. Um, benchmarking their different building typologies and the EUI, the energy use intensity. Um, per, and this is source. So this includes, this actually includes the fuel source. So it's not just on-site energy use intensity. Uh, intensity. And um, you can see the numbers are very, very high. You can see where the passive house standard lives on the far right there. And this is the PHI standard at 38. And then you can see our three preliminary certified projects all below that 38. And what happens if they hadn't gotten to 38? I mean, maybe they got to 40. Would that have been so bad in the scheme of what we're really talking about? So I wanted to kind of leave you with that uh, because we certainly hear about teams that couldn't pass that final blower door and it feels soul crushing after all the work, but you have to kind of put it in perspective with the quality and caliber of what you're doing um, compared to the rest. And last but not least, everything I've been talking about is new construction, which is a small wedge at the top of this chart in purple and lavender uh, of what's going on in the world these days, certainly in the United States. And um, the vast majority already exists and some of it will get torn down, but most of it won't. It'll need to be renovated. And so I actually have almost half of my projects right now um, are not passive house new construction, um, which is almost, I won't call it simple, but it's like, we know how to do that. 
It's deep energy retrofits of existing buildings typically occupied um, and needing to remain occupied. And whoa, baby, is that a nut to crack? So that's kind of where we're heading. Um, the Boston Housing Authority has a has mandated that their whole portfolio needs to be fossil fuel free by 2050. And we are working on the first project along those lines to try to get it fossil fuel free and do a full deep energy retrofit. Um, we're in the early stages. We'll find out if they can afford to do it, but they say they want it to be the pilot project. So time will tell. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop sharing. Turn it over to questions. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Great, great presentation. Uh, we do have a, a bunch of questions and we would like to get to all of them. So first we'll uh, we'll take, thank our sponsors and we'll come back to them. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you too to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Bewiso, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Coltraco Ultrasonics, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. Thank you, sponsors. All right, so we are back now for a quick poll, which you can all tick the box that you identify with or that you have experience with. And in the meantime, I'll be starting with the first question uh, from George. George Oster in Brooklyn. Hey, buddy. Um, so the question is, redefine boundary. What is the justification to simply simply declare the trouble spots, uh, elevator, laundry room, trash chute, et cetera, that use energy are excluded from passive house, even though integral to function of the building? Seems like cherry picking the easy portions only to achieve certification. Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. So the energy is not excluded. It's still in the model. Everything that's happening in those spaces is still being modeled, and you, know, you, you don't get to you don't get to ignore it. Just like you don't get to ignore the garage lighting or whatever else is happening in those unconditioned space, it's still factored in. It's simply for the purposes of the blower door test. Um, we want those spaces to be air separated from an air tightness perspective. Yeah, and I and I think it also we would try to leave the ones that are supposed to remain open when the building is operational, right? right? So that we are not accounting for that air loss because it's still, you know, it's it's, it's expected to have some air loss anyway. Yeah. All right, so next is Bev Craig, Mass CEC. Mass Save has been paying for half the cost of people getting accreditations, various passive house accreditations. And obviously training is really important. So from your perspective, and obviously you are trained, but like team members in general, what do you, who do you think is the most important to get uh, training to? Is it contractors? Is it MEPs? Is it the architect? Is it, you know, oh, that's obviously- a good question. <laughs> um, the architect is critical. I think that's critical. Um, and thank you for mentioning that program because we have three folks who are planning to take it in the fall taking advantage of that discount, so I'm excited. Um, I mean, they all matter. I will, you know, I've, I have to say, um, I have worked too many times with MEP engineers, particularly let's just focus on the mechanical side, that don't trust the air tightness um, reality. And if you don't trust that, you won't design the, the right sized system that we need. So that's pretty critical. You have to be able, they have to have the confidence in that because they're used to having 
a factor, right? A kind of a, a buffer in there. And that buffer is a lot bigger than it wants to be. And then you, they're, they're oversizing the system. Um, so that's critical. Um, the builder is important, but I feel to some extent, the builder is very important, but I feel like if they are, if they have the opportunity to just be on a project with an experienced team, they'll, they, they can learn as they do, because that's what they, they, they are doers. And I think that's one of the most effective ways to learn anyway. Uh, Beth, do you, do you want to go on another comment or any other question? I think I have you following your own question. How does somebody else go? I need to look back at my <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, so next we have Armin, Armin Menendian. Uh, are you there to ask your question or should I read it? Let's oh, see, no oh, mic is no. what I see. No microphone. All right. So his question is, make sure I have the right one. Uh, the memo you send a con ah, sorry. The memo you send a subcontractor whose work doesn't conform to Pacifal's requirements. What exactly is in the first and second memos? I don't usually send memos to subcontractors. That's probably coming from the builder, the GC. Um, and I don't know if they send memos either. Um, I definitely have seen, as I said before, uh, I can't stand when we are remediating new construction work. Um, it happens at some level in almost every project. People are moving fast. Um, and these projects are big and they have really tight timeframes. And there's a lot of folks on the site and they're not, sometimes something just happens that wasn't done according to the detail. In almost all cases, um, the, the GC has made them redo it. I mean, if it's if it if it matters to the therm, to the thermal or antinous performance in particular, we had a project um, that's just wrapping up construction right now where we have a an insulated roof and the thermal envelope is at the roof, so that it's that's also the airtight layer, so the attic is fully inside the passive house. And that's how it's detailed and it's pretty clearly spelled out and the GC knew that, but for some reason when the sub came on the site, they cut the entire ridge line to add a ridge vent um, and cut the entire brand new air barrier across the building. It was just, but they had to go back and fix it. I mean, it's an, it's, it's a real bummer because it's, it's a lot of expense for that sub who, you know, didn't pay attention. Um, and it's time for the team. And it's usually not as good of an outcome either. It's harder to get it to be right, I should say. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess sending memos in, in light of those possible problems is just sending whatever document you can so you can address them. Because in the end, you want to make sure they are all addressed. Exactly. That's right. The and the Raider, the Raider verifier um, was the one on site that day saying, why are they cutting a ridge vent in? <laughs> so, you know, it takes a team, um, he, he saw it. And then the GC went run, you know, the super went running over and was like, what's happening? And um, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to have the team. It's good to have everyone in the loop. That's why those first meetings are really important, especially in making sure the general contractor can relay that to the subs that come after um, when it, the act work is actually starting. Uh, okay, so we have a couple more questions, but I would like to pass it on to Kim for uh, the next events. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really exciting events coming in. Uh, I, want, I definitely want to go see Juan Manuel and his presentation in Spain. Uh, I'm glad we're having more Spanish uh, people, for sure, in the, in the program, and hopefully stuff in Spanish in general. I can, I can lend my bilingual skills there a little bit. Uh, so... The next question is from Rob Huskin. Uh, Rob, are you are you mic'd up or still here? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, first, there was a comment. I I just uh, wanted to second the um, the goodness of uh, developing collaborative relationships with the construction team. 
um, it's it's great when that that happens. <clears throat> um, working together rather than kind of trying to hold a stick over over their heads. Um, and then my my question was related to QAQC. I, I I appreciate the emphasis on testing. Um, wanted to wanted to take a little bit further, um, possibly a little bit out of the passive building realm, but still in the quality realm. Of um, have you ever done um, water leakage testing or anything like that, such as as spray rack testing to verify um, the robustness of the building envelope, in addition to what's required for passive house? Uh, great question. I don't know that um, that's been done on any of my projects. We have been talking, we have been, Finch has a good deal of monitoring um, in the building for both air quality, um, volatile, volatile organics, CO2, uh, humidity, uh, as well as um, the water risers are being monitored so that if there is a leak, it's um, quickly apparent. And we're increasingly talking about monitoring so that we have more of a feedback loop for both for durability, but also to make sure these tight buildings are, are as healthy as we expect them to be. But I don't know the specifics about the water monitoring that you're describing. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. All right, up, up next, we have Jay Murdoch. Thank you, Jose. Hey, uh, Michelle, thank you. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, I came on a little bit late. I think you might have covered this. I came on when I saw an axon, so maybe you're answering my question. So, so the general contractor and the trades can visualize all the critical interfaces and the required sequencing. Uh, do you do mock-ups? Do you do build mock-ups? Uh, do you have an on-site tutorial before, or do you do, are you on-site for critical installs? Um, yeah and then related to that like what 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 um uh, so if you if you come up with a remedy or a solution to deal with a, a misunderstanding of communication do you do you integrate those into your next plans and specs for passive house and non-passive house projects i would I hope so okay. Okay. <laughs> that's the, that's definitely the goal um we have a monthly ca lessons learned conversation internally over lunch and share the, the do's and don'ts that came up in the field and, and we try to get those integrated back into our, our design. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned mock-ups. Yes, every project that we do has a mock-up even before we were doing Passive House. Um, it's so important to see how things are coming together and you know that understand um, if it's looking the way you intended but also performing the way you intended. So the first mock-up we design a mock-up that kind of covers the range of conditions, always has a window and in it, often a door. Um, and the first mock-up is always the window installation mock-up. And it often involves several hours of sitting there watching these poor folks like taping and cutting and um, and then some, you know, usually we have an envelope consultant who has been specifically hired to do window testing of both the window itself to make sure the window itself from the factory doesn't have an issue. And then secondly, the window in the assembly so we can make sure that the way we detailed it um, is working. And invariably, one of them doesn't pass the first time and we find something that wasn't intended. Um, so yeah, the mock-up is critical. Thank you. All right, we have a couple more minutes. So we have three more questions. Um, Armin Menendian again. Uh, I think he had a problem with his mic, if I recall correctly. So yeah, I'll go ahead and ask the question. Uh, any specific tips for introducing your Passive House project to potential GCs new to Passive House? Uh, wording, anticipating their concerns, drawing graphics, contracts, yeah, um, I think the two keys, one is not to over, you know, not to raise red flags over it, as I had said earlier during the conversation, we definitely did originally, um, but more to just understand that this these aren't 
highly irregular buildings. All the same trades are necessary. Uh, it's just it's just attention to detail. Um, you also have to have a builder who really actually wants to do it. So we had one project um, that got priced. It was intended to be passive house. It was actually started part. It was actually um, pursuing the um, initial mass CEC um, design challenge, and they had it priced by two builders. Both came in very high. We had hour long calls or more with each of the builders to sort of walk through the things that they were seeing that, um, and this is often a conversation, you know, is it the heating system that your sub is having a hard time with? Is it, they think the ERV is too onerous? Or is it the insulation on the outside? You know, there's not that many variables that make it so wildly different. Um, we got off the calls with these two GCs One's number went down by like a million dollars. The other number went up by like a million dollars. <laughs> Go figure. I'm going to jump in because I have another related story oh. to this, which is um, Julie Klump, who some of you might have seen on the Reimagine Buildings uh, Salem Heights retrofit. She had a similar experience to Michelle where uh, they would picked the GC but hadn't bought out the subs yet. And it didn't get funded in the first round. And so they were going back to revise. And they decided to upgrade to passive house and all the subs freaked out and put huge numbers in. And so Julie's approach was to have the passive house consultants have an envelope pre rebid and then a, a mechanicals pre bid. And so the really high increase got really decreased and a lot of it was complete misunderstanding about what was in the drawings and what the difference was. So having those like uh, meetings with those trades really helped a lot with the pricing. Anna, go, go ahead. Uh, Beth was also sharing some of her experiences in this whole trade and value engineering situation, which is a, it, it's a big one to understand. So uh, I don't know if you want to finish your previous thought or story. I think I was just about done. Um... I guess I would also say to the extent that you can have a builder on, you know, doing pre-construction uh, services on a team, um, that's just unbelievably helpful because it's not, this is not a prescriptive path, right? We, we, this is performance-based and there's lots of ways to get there. And so whether it's what's the right wall assembly or the right insulation type or you know which systems we're going to use. These are all things that a builder can really um, take the pulse of the market in that moment. And it's not this, this, what the decision you made on the last job may not be the, the best choice from a cost-effective or implementation perspective on this one. So um, we really benefited from that on Finch um, and um, more and more. It's hard with our affordable projects to, sometimes to have a builder on board early, um, but if we can, it makes a world of difference. Yeah, th thank you for that insight. Um, I Okay, I have one more question and I think we'll kind of wrap it up. It's from Rob Hoskins. Uh, Rob, are you online? Yeah, hi, it popped up again. Um, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I was, uh, responding to the comment about the engine, uh, MEP engineers being like skeptical about um, the air leakage. Um, my experience, I think, is that the the software that a lot of engineers use doesn't model air leakage and as, yes. as like Woofy or Passive House software. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that and how how that can be, um, you know, remedied. I'm not sure how it can be remedied, but you're absolutely right. Not all energy bottling software takes into account infiltration. And we've explored a number of different things that might be more architecture friendly for our office. Um, and very few allow you to um, address the infiltration rate. Or if they do, they only allow you to go down to a certain level and it's not low enough. So it doesn't help us really dial in things, right? The, our whole point is if, if we're at that level, then what's the right amount of insulation? What's too much? What's too little? Let's optimize. Um, so it is a, that is a challenge. Um, I think the engineers who are in this space and get it probably have a, a way to do that. 
Um, but you're, I think that is a very fair point that that's one of the reasons that it might be, they might be skeptical. And sometimes you get an MEP, they'll actually get certified passive house consultants. So like Peterson Engineering has like eight of them, I believe. And they also have yeah. like 40, 45, 46 projects in Massachusetts right now. So that are passive house projects. Yeah. <laughs> Including the vast majority of ours, because they... <laughs> You don't have to convince them. They, they tell you, you're going to get better tightness, right? Yes. Okay. Then I'm going to design the system right. 